My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and uh, I'm not sure how necessary an introduction is for my teacher today, but for the three of you out there who aren't familiar with him, I'll go ahead. Uh, Bramford Marsalis is here with me today. You might know him as the uh, music director of The Tonight Show, which he did for a couple of years. Uh, He's also the host of NPR's Jazz Set. He's a composer, an NEA jazz master, and a three-time Grammy Award-winning saxophonist. Uh, He comes from a family of musicians, and he's actually performed, and this blew my mind, uh, with Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, He's also been a soloist with orchestras like the Chicago Symphony and the New York Philharmonic. He's the leader of the Branford Marsalis Quartet and a frequent soloist with many classical ensembles. Branford Marsalis, welcome to the Classical Classroom. Hi, Daisha. So what are you going to be teaching me about today? Whatever whatever you want. <laughs> I want you to teach you just... me about some classical music. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that we should talk about the intersection of jazz and classical music, and in particular, this very cool CPE Bach piece that you have on your uh, CD, In My Solitude, which came out in 2014. That works for me. Well, what came, mm-hmm. what came first for you? I was curious because I was looking at your discography, and you've got... Um, jazz and classical. You're you're more known for your jazz, of course, but but mm-hmm. what what came first for you? I mean, you came from this big family of musicians. What was what came? Yeah. Well, it wasn't a big family of musicians when I was growing up. Oh, okay. Uh, what came first for me was wor- working in a coal mine. Working in a coal mine, going down, down, down. That was the first song I ever learned, and I'd walk around the house singing it over and over again when I was four years old or three or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, I played piano when I was five, hated the piano. Uh, so when I was in first or second grade, second or third grade, I used the clarinet as an excuse to get off of the piano because I said, I have to. I want to join the school band mm-hmm. and I can't do it on piano. So that was my way to get off of the piano. Yeah. So I never looked back. I try to avoid being near piano. <laughs> Uh, why did you hate it so much? Because of the traumatic much? experience. It's hard to, why does, it, why does somebody hate Brussels sprouts? I don't think they have an answer for that. It's just a reflexive you know, reaction. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't like it. That's an interesting analogy because, you know, Brussels sprouts, they're typically known as this, you know, healthy food that all children just automatically hate. Is that how the piano was? Oh, not just children. <laughs> Adults too. Uh, for me, yes. I think. I think one reason... Is that it's it, as I've grown older, I have learned to become solitary, mm-hmm. and the piano is an incredibly solitary instrument, mm-hmm. uh, especially when you're learning how to play it. You practice by yourself. You it's self-contained. You play most of the pieces by yourself. Yeah. When you're seven, eight years old, you're really not dabbling in chamber music. You just spend a lot of time in the living room playing by yourself. And I wanted to be outside playing with my friends. I never really thought about how solitary it is to to play piano. Because, I mean, it's not included in any school orchestras or bands or anything like that. It, it's and, just... it's, it's, it, and it's solitary to practice yeah. any instrument. Yeah. Uh, when you started playing piano, was that your introduction to classical music? Or is that the kind of music you were playing then? Or did you? Yeah, it was. Okay. But it was, it was kids' music, though. It was, it was, yeah. it was rudimentary kids' Fur release or uh, some of those simple things Mozart wrote for two piano players that I played with. My playing partner was Barbara Kraus, mm-hmm. and we played this Mozart piece, and I didn't practice a lot. And I remember we did this concert, and my mother was haranguing me, basically <laughs> saying, you're going to mess up on stage because you didn't practice. I said, no, I got it, Mom, I got it. And she was so nervous that when we went on stage, she got up and walked out and... 
looked at the concert through the little glass window yeah. and those old wooden doors they used to have everywhere. Mm -hmm. She was so nervous. She got out and we played and we aced it. We aced the nice. piece. Nice. And then when when, but in my mind as a seven or eight year old or whatever it was, it was you know she's just doing this because I didn't practice. So I saw her looking through the window and I stuck my tongue out at her after we <laughs> did the bow. And that was just like the end. Yeah, that was pretty much at the end of my piano playing career because I just wasn't, it wasn't for me. But that's also when you became, you knew that you were going to become a musical badass as an adult. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. no? I, I just love playing music. Yeah. Uh, I think Winton knew early mm -hmm. he was going to be a musical badass. He was 12 or 13. He's like, yeah, I'm going to be a badass, man. And I was like, that's great, bro. You know, <laughs> I was just playing in R&B bands and. It was one of these things where I was going to be a history teacher and play music on the weekends. Yeah. I had no intention of becoming a professional musician and uh, went and started calling me from New York because he had gone to, Ju he went to Juilliard and he was like, man, you need to be up here. I heard these guys, I mean, you're as good as they are. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm sure, bro. But, you know, you have fun up there in the big city. I'm just going to be a little country boy and stay down here. And, yeah. And my, my dad says, uh, you know, I understand you're thinking about uh, going east. I said, well, I'm thinking about it. And he says, well, all I can tell you is, is that all this kind of stuff is a young man's game, and you don't want to be 40 years old with a couple of kids sitting down here wondering what could have been. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, that was the thing that got me. I said, you know, he's right. So <laughs> I'll go to New York for six months. It won't work out, and then I'll come home. <laughs> and I can say, well, I went, and it wasn't meant to be. Uh -huh. And I went to New York, and... I gave it six months, and in the fifth month, I started working, and I got stuck there. <laughs> you got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it felt. And that's when that's when it happened for you. That's when you were kind of like, yeah, well, this is what I'm doing with my well, life now. Well, I, I, I thought if I can if I can make enough money to pay for a two bedroom apartment, then I'm a success. Uh -huh. uh, I really didn't get this bug until my thirties, right around the time that I left uh, Jay's show, the Jay Leno show. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if you're going to leave the show, then you got to dedicate yourself to music for real and practice and find out how good you can be. Yeah. I made that promise to myself. So it was 1995. Over the course of all of this, you're recording all of these CDs. You know, you're playing with all of these incredible musicians. And tell me, I'll go back to your discography. And, you know, obviously, I, I can see where the, the jazz comes in, but where does the classical come in? I mean, I'm looking at, on your website, you've got, you know, there is a link for classical Branford and jazz Branford. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't agree with that. Oh, okay. You, this is, this is your website that. people's fault? Yeah, okay. my manager did that. <laughs> I think it's a really lousy idea. Why? Why is but it? Is it just because you don't see such a distinction? Because it's the same person. Yeah. I don't put on a, you know, I don't change my voice. <laughs> you know? And talking to classical I, music voice. <laughs> I'm playing classical music now. I mean, it's the same guy. Yeah. But is it is different? It, yeah. You, like, is it different when you're, when you're playing? Are you using different mental muscles? Or is it really just no, the same? It's the same 12 notes. Yeah. That's what's so cool about it, and that's what's so amazing about it, is that, you know, you have Beyonce and you have Beethoven, and they use the same 12 notes. Yes. Oh, Ludwig okay. uses them slightly better than she does, but that's beside the point. <laughs> it's just that it's the same 12 notes. Mm -hmm. So what makes music music is clearly not the notes. Mm -hmm. It is how the notes are articulated. Yeah. How the notes sound. Yeah. How you use space. How you use dynamics. That is what makes music unique. Speaking of space, I was thinking of your your new CD. I was listening to it yesterday. And it's got all of these jazz uh, standards, improvisations. It's got songs like Stardust on it. And then right in the middle... You've got this movement from a CPE Bach sonata. It's the sonata in A minor for oboe. When I, I listen to a different version of it, a more kind of traditional, I guess, classical music version of the sonata, 
And it had that sort of bouncy、right. early music feel、right. to it. A lot of that ornamentation. But the way that you play it is really different. Can you talk well, about I, that? Well, I thought about it. The soprano saxophone lends itself to oboe music really, really well. So originally I thought about、mm. it on, on soprano, but the more I listened to, the, to the, the, the traditional performance of it, I was just focused on listening to the melody. I realized that the melody lent itself to a different interpretation without a tremendous amount of effort. Because in, in, the,、mm-hmm. in this quest to be different, for me, if you have to spend hours and hours working on it, then it's not really different. You're just manufacturing it. So it was just a subtle、mm-hmm. difference between playing it on soprano or playing it on tenor. There's something about the beauty of the melody. I, I thought, yeah, if you play it on tenor, it takes on a completely different life. I wouldn't have felt so compelled to play it straight, you know, or, or in the traditional fashion. If I played on soprano, I most certainly would have felt compelled to play it、uh, in, the, in the traditional fashion. The way that you use space, and I mean, the, the sound inside of the Grace Cathedral, it's just, it's like haunting and stark. Right. Well, it's the only way that that can be effective. Yeah. Things. If you have a seven second delay in a room, which is what the Grace Cathedral has,、mm-hmm. then instinctively to me it's clear I will be more successful playing fewer notes than I would playing lots.、Yeah. And because I've spent 30 years working on a very large, having a very wide vocabulary, I am able to play songs that have powerful melodies and get the point across with the fewest notes possible. Yeah. Because anything else just it doesn't work really. The space is what makes the, the record work. The tension between the notes. Yeah, the silence. The silence creates the tension.、Mm-hmm. Particularly now because everything in our, our, our modern lives is so instant and so immediate and so rushed and so hurried. I remember when MTV started making videos, it wasn't immediate, probably around 1990. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, every three seconds there was a new cut, and the cuts were abrupt. It wasn't like they were using f- dissolves or fades. They were just going to hard cuts from image to image to image to image.、Right. And it was hard for me to watch. Yeah. Because I was so used to watching movies and all these other things. I took a film class in, in high school. And we studied、uh, Ak- Akita Kurosawa and.、Uh, Francois Truffaut,、mm-hmm. and then suddenly you're looking at these videos, and there's all these constant motion. But my son, who's now 29, he grew up on that. So he's used to seeing constant motion,、yeah. constant energy, constant movement, constant、uh, gratification. So when you remove that from an environment, it can be very, sometimes it can just be very boring for people. And other people, they, can feel, they feel stressed because they're not used to hearing so much silence.、Mm-hmm. But I think it's the only way for that record to, to have been successful. It's, it's just, I, I don't know. I was, I was listening to it and I was just I was completely taken by it. And I think it was because of exactly what you said, just like that, that space where you're sort of waiting for the next note to drop. You know, because there w a s no other instruments, I could take my time. I could play it the way I wanted to play it in that moment.、Uh, it's one、yeah. of those things I learned a, a long time ago when I was playing by myself. And my, my teacher, my teacher, Dr. Bro, Burt Bro said,、uh, with his, he used to hold his, 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 you know, in, his index finger and his thumb just underneath his chin when he talked to you. And he goes, huh. He says, you, he says, 
<laughs> you realize there's no band playing with you. I said, yeah, I know Dr. Bush. Said, so why are you playing like there's a band playing with you? <laughs> it oh. was just one of those simple things. <laughs> there's no one here but you, so you can actually take your time. The music can't go anywhere until you start playing. No. Saying that and doing oh, wow. that are two different things. It wasn't like, uh, you know, at the age of yeah. 15, I went, oh, yeah, got it. He just confused me. But mm -hmm. as I got older, there were times when, when that conversation really took hold. And I just said, yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in a hurry. I don't have anywhere to go. And uh, they can't start mm -hmm. until I start. So I would hold... I would not play for much longer than was comfortable for a lot of you and the performers. And they say, why do you do that? I said, you can't hear it, huh? Too bad. You can't start until I do. So, And they gradually started to say, you know, that's really, <laughs> that's really cool. It's a really great effect. I said, yeah, I mean, what's the hurry? So yeah. Dr. Bro's conversation from that's the age of 15, uh, I mean, how many years ago is that? 30, 30, 33, 34 years later? He really, he really hooked me up. It stuck with you. Mm-hmm. If I hadn't looked at the names of the tracks, I wouldn't, known, wouldn't have known that that, that CPE Bach was a CPE Bach piece because it just fits so seamlessly in with, with the rest of the, you know, right next to Stardust. So can you talk about why it fits so well with all of those jazz pieces? Well, most of the pieces wouldn't actually be considered jazz pieces at all, hmm. given what jazz has, has become. Mm -hmm. Well, Wenton actually said it first. We were talking one day, and I was mentioning, I said, I'm really tired of people saying that the essential tenet of jazz is improvisation because all cultures in the world have improvised for thousands of years. Jazz mm -hmm. did not invent improvisation. Mm -hmm. And then Wenton says, yeah, man, the only two things that you could say that w were invented by jazz or jazz contributed to the discussion in Western music is the consistent use of the flatted third and the flatted seventh in a melodic context and the swing beat. Hmm. And he said that, I went, wow, that pretty much wraps it up. I mean, <laughs> he said it in one sentence. I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. So using that as a formula, I started listening to, to, to modern jazz because there's this constant discussion about how unpopular jazz is mm -hmm. and, and why uh, it doesn't uh, command a larger market share, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if the two things that people found attractive about jazz were the consistent use of the flatted third and flatted seventh in the melodic context and the swing beat, those are the two things that modern jazz musicians do not do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I think about songs now with, with the band, what I always tell the guys is that the song has to have a great melody and a good beat. Mm -hmm. And everything else, if, the, if it has those two things, everything else we do will be fine. Yeah. But if we have songs that are in very strange meters with ostinato bass lines and melodies that are just, you know, a stream of 16th notes that are scalic in nature, there's a low level success rate there. Yeah. So uh, we started moving away from that idea. And uh, this concert, uh, because uh, it, it's a solo saxophone concert that was recorded. Yeah was one of these concerts where when you were by yourself playing a saxophone in front of an audience, and it was a sizable audience, the only way you're going to be able to sustain their, their, their attention for an hour and a half is through melody. Mm -hmm. Because when you start playing solos to the untrained ear, by the third solo, it just all sounds the same. Yeah. So if your idea is to go up there and solo your way through it, <laughs> uh, it becomes this very strange... In a, in, a, in a room with a hundred people, it becomes a conversation between you and the four other people that get it. Yeah. And yeah. the idea, to me, music is like a microwave. What do we know about a microwave? You put something in, you push a button, and it gets hot. Right. People put on music, they want to feel happiness, they want to feel sadness. They like it or they don't like it. Yeah. 
And if you were going to buy a microwave and the salesman said, I would be happy to sell you this microwave, but first you have to explain to me in a hundred words or less the physical properties of microwave technology. <laughs> You'd say, thank you very much, and you go across the street and you buy it from someone else. And so much of what happens in jazz and in classical music now, uh, you have to know music to know why it's relevant. Mm -hmm. You know what's beautiful about NPR is that I actually learned how a microwave works like two days ago listening to a show. Then you should appreciate jazz. I should, <laughs> and I do. <laughs> I was just thinking you were talking about improvisation and jazz and how that's, that's it's kind of a major part, but you kind of have to keep it reined in. I was thinking about improvisation in classical music, in early music in particular, which was very much a thing. I, f I feel like maybe classical has moved in the opposite direction, where it seems like there's less improvisation than, than there was at its outset. Early classical music was chamber music. Mm -hmm. uh, I was playing with the Philadelphia Chamber Orchestra last year, and the review in Los Angeles was a very negative review. And the what the, the writer said something that I thought was the funniest thing in the world because he was saying that the orchestra played uh, to in to his ear really tired rehashed dynamic markings that were so obviously rehearsed that it lacked spontaneity. Mm -hmm. So when I read it, some of the orchestra people were kind of bummed. I said, "Well, he might be onto something because." I guess there is a secret code that allows 60 people to simultaneously change musical directions and everyone will just know <laughs> where it is. Telepathy, perhaps? Probably. But it is absolutely impossible for large orchestras or large musical groups to not choreograph their dynamic markings. Mm -hmm. Now, smaller groups, chamber groups, all sorts of things can happen. Yeah. So if you were to spend time going to chamber concerts, you see it all the time. I mean, the, the music is moving in ways that large orchestras simply cannot move. I mean, conductors had to essentially amend their downbeat is essentially an upbeat so the people in the back can see it because when their hand goes mm -hmm. down, the people at the back of the orchestra, the orchestras are so big, the percussionists can't even see the, the, the conductor's hands. Do you so, think this is why improv in classical music kind of went away because orchestras grew in size? Well, it, there is improv, but it's it's more of a po collective kind of improvisation. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a re relationship between the conductor and the orchestra. For instance, if the conductor holds a note a little longer than he held it last night, mm -hmm. if the orchestra is paying attention, they're going to hold that note. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the tempos are faster, sometimes they're slower. They're never the same. They're never the same because this is essentially what improv is. Mm -hmm. When you go to orchestral performances with great bands and successive nights, the music has a very, very different life to it. It's different every night. Mm. And those are the things that are exciting to people. The idea of, because extemporaneous speaking is not truly extemporaneous. Uh, you, you, your improvisation is, is only as good as your vocabulary. And when you have a limited vocabulary, then you tend to repeat yourself yeah. over and over yeah. again. And so in order to actually improvise you have to have an incredibly expansive uh, vocabulary and you can draw from all of these things to sustain an, an, the interest of an audience mm -hmm. that is essentially because I figure 90 percent of my audiences they, they are lay people they are not m musical experts right so I I just think that the, it's it's impossible to expect an orchestra that is playing die Valkyrie by Wagner with 15 singers on stage just improvise. <laughs> just start, just start. Hey, let's play soft here. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, yeah. that's, not, that's, not really, that's not really what you want. But yeah. if you go to enough performances, it is different from night to night. 
And mm-hmm. that's what re- really what you want. Uh, that's true. The only people that yeah. really, the only people that really improvised in early Baroque music was mostly the 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 the, the harpsichord player, which is still incredible because people still do that. Yeah. Uh, the harpsichordist in the orchestra I played with Rafael Fusco. Uh, one of the pieces had a transcribed part for him, and he went bananas. He says, "I can't read this. Does anybody have the original?" And I said, "Well, I do have the original because all he wanted was a melody line and the bass line, and he would fill in the blanks from there." Right? Isn't that called the so, continuo? The yes, where it's got just continuo. basically the bass line, and then you kind of just play. Basso continuo. Yeah, you are correct. Okay. Oh, I learned something. <laughs> you already knew that, ma'am. I, I did. I, I, I've actually learned something from doing all these episodes. Mm-hmm. Well, I know um, we're about to run out of time here, but I was wondering if you could leave us with any final thoughts about jazz and classical music and how they, the marriage of those two things for you. I don't, there's not really a marriage of the two. They're things that they mm-hmm. have in common Yeah. Uh, when done well. And when it's done well, when the musicians are highly skilled as jazz musicians, not just as instrumentalists, the music takes on a life where we can play the same songs every night and it's never the same. Yeah. And that's that's the way great classical music is. It takes on a life of its own. And what I like to say is that uh, jazz is at its best is conversational and classical music at its best is kind of like actors in a play. Mm-hmm. You have to invent a character. You have to make that character believable to an audience, and you have to memorize 10,000 words and s- repeat them as though they're yours. Mm-hmm. And that's similar to what it is when you have to learn a, a symphonic piece, is that you have to learn thousands of notes, but you have to play those notes in a fashion where it is basically like you telling a story. Just the mere execution is not enough. It is for, for certain musicians. Execution is more important than anything. Mm-hmm. But for an audience... There has to be an emotional import to it. There has to be an emotional relevance to it. And it has to sound like there's a story being told. And when you can do that, then they don't notice how difficult the notes are or how sometimes how tedious the piece can be. They tend to enjoy that experience. Yeah. I love that distinction. Every, almost every single musician that I've talked to on the classical classroom has told me that about the stories within the classical music. Right. The stories that they infuse the music with. And uh, so I think it's really interesting that you say that. Well, I think sound has the power, when, when properly harnessed, sound has the power to create emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can create... And I, I listen to a lot of opera, and suddenly when a singer's singing a part and they decide to not use vibrato, there's such a power to that when they do it, particularly if they're holding long notes and the vibrato comes 30 seconds later. There's a there's an emotional power to that. Yeah. Uh, and, and they pick and choose times, times of indecision, times of mourning, uh, you know, times of suspense. Suddenly there's no vibrato when the singer sings and you feel the tension. Mm-hmm. You know, when when love is the issue, then there's always vibrato. So Italian music always has vibrato because it was usually <laughs> always about love or love lost or love found, and then yeah. the woman dies in the end, and there's much lamentation in the village. And but uh, if you listen to German opera, it it, it has this wide gamut of emotions. Yeah. And the, the the great composers like Wagner and like uh, Richard Strauss, and not to say that you know Puccini and Verdi weren't great. That's not really what I'm saying, but they were able to use more complicated storylines and the singers suddenly had to use certain techniques to represent the the emotional import of those Mm storylines. And same thing in Russian opera as well. So, uh, I mean, that's our job and that's the challenge for me. The challenge of any instrumental musician, regardless of the style, is to use the sound of the instrument to create emotion for an audience. And it's hard to do and you can't learn it in school. You got to figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, Branford Marcellus, it has been awesome to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, My pleasure, Daisha. I had a great time. Well, and uh, I should mention, too, that uh, Decamera of Houston is going to be bringing you here to Houston uh, this April 18th. What's the name of your show? Evening with Branford Marcellus. That's, yeah, I think it's something like that. Yeah, that's, okay. that, that's the, that, yeah there's, a, there's a story behind that, but we, we won't bore the people with that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks so much. It was great to talk to you, Bramford. I hope we get to talk again you sometime. As well. All right, everybody. That 
does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom or to our SoundCloud page. You can follow us on Twitter or Tumblr or subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn. Don't forget to rate and review us because it makes us really happy. You can also send me $2 and I'll put the show on a casingle for you. There are so many ways to listen. By the way, you can email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Thanks today to audio producer Todd the Twister Holsander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for the frequent TMI. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing laser beam eyes. Thanks to Branford Marcellus for being on the show. Thanks to me for saying words. But most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>